So we are going to talk about curl, which is an important property of vector fields that exists at every point on the vector field. One definition of curl that we're going to use because it's useful for building understanding of curl is that the curl of a vector field f at some point dotted with n is equal to the limit as a approaches 0 from the right of 1 over a times the integral, the line integral over some closed curve c of f dot dr. In this case, n is a unit vector and c is a counterclockwise closed curve in the plane defined by n. Now that's a lot of information at one time, so we're going to go into each part separately in depth and get an understanding of what each element is doing. Let's start from the inside of this right expression here, this integral over some closed curve c. If you aren't familiar with vector field line integrals, I've left a link in the description to a video that explains that. The idea of a vector field line integral is let's say this is the point A where we're evaluating curl. We take some closed curve C around that point that goes in a particular direction where we're moving along the curve. The vector field line integral measures how much this vector field F is parallel to the direction of the curve as we move along the entire curve. So for example, if the vector field F pointed upward right here on the curve, because the curve also points upward, this vector field line integral is going to be positive around that point. Similarly, if we want the vector field to be parallel to the curve on the top, this vector field is going to need to point to the left, because as we move counterclockwise, that's the direction the curve is going to be pointing. Similarly, over here, the vector field will need to point down, and down here, the vector field will need to point to the right. This is just following the counterclockwise movement of a closed curve. We see on the right side of the equation that we're taking the limit as the area inside of this curve approaches zero. So we're going to make this curve smaller and smaller and smaller, closing in on our point A where we're evaluating the curve. Now the reason that we divide by the area in here is that as we make the curve smaller, the value of this line integral is also going to get smaller. So we have to account for that by dividing the area to make sure that we're approaching a finite value. Now let's think about what this line integral would look like if our vector field were a constant. That is, at every single point when we put it into the vector field, we get the exact same vector back. In that case, if we're looking at our closed curve C here, let's say our vector field always points to the right. If we think about the component of our vector field F that's in the direction of the curve C. On the left and right, because the curve is moving up and down, it's going to be perpendicular to our vector field, which means that the component of the vector field parallel to the curve, that's just going to be zero. But on the top and bottom, on the top, the curve is going to be moving to the left, whereas the vector field points to the right. That means we're going to get a negative value up here because they're moving in the opposite directions. On the other hand, on the bottom, the curve and the vector field are both pointing to the right in the same direction. So down here, the result f dot dr is going to be positive. And on the top, f dot dr is going to be negative. If we integrate over the entire closed curve, the positive and the negative components are going to cancel out, and we are going to get zero. That means that no constant vector field can have a non-zero closed line integral. So for this value to be non-zero, the vector field has to be changing as we move around the point. In particular, if we want this integral to be positive, as we move to the right, the vector field has to point more upward. As we move to the left, it has to point more downward. That's a very interesting situation, because as we move in a particular direction, in order for this value to be positive, the vector field has to increase perpendicular to the direction we're moving. As we move to the right, it has to point more upward. The reason for that comes down to some basic geometry. One of the simplest examples of a closed curve is a circle. So let's consider 
a closed curve that is a circle. In that case, our center of the circle is the point where we're evaluating the curl. If we think about the displacement from this center point to the circle, the curve over which we're integrating, this line segment is a radius of the circle. On the other hand, the direction that the curve is moving will be in the direction of the tangent line to the curve, the tangent to the circle. But we know from geometry that the tangent to a circle is always perpendicular to its radius. And what that means is if our closed curve is a circle, the direction of movement along our curve is always exactly perpendicular to our displacement from the original point. And that's why as we move to the right, our vector field has to point more upward in order for this value to be positive. That's also where the function curl gets its name. The reason it's called curl is because as we move away from the original point, in order for this curl to be positive, the vector field has to curl in the direction orthogonal to displacement. So now we have a pretty good idea of what this limit expression of the line integral is measuring, but we're not quite done yet because take a look at the left side of this equation. This limit is not the formula for curl of f. Instead, it's the formula for the dot product between the curl of our vector field and a unit vector. So what is the purpose of this unit vector n? What does it do? Well, first of all, remember that a plane can be defined in terms of a point and a normal vector to the plane. In order to talk about a vector field line integral over a closed curve, to get some more specification, we want to define a plane in which we are going to put the curve for our line integral. And the way that we define that plane is in terms of this unit vector. C is a curve in the plane defined by n. For example, if our unit vector n were equal to 0, 0, 1, a unit vector that points entirely in the z direction, then the curve would be in the xy plane, the plane that is normal to this unit vector. So now we need to get from this equation to an actual formula for curl. And in order to do that, we're going to use a really cool property of dot products. Let's think about this. Say we take some vector a, b, c, and we do the dot product with 1, 0, 0. What is the result that we're going to get? Well, when we take the dot product with a unit vector, it measures the component of our original vector in the direction of that unit vector. In this case, our vector just points in the x direction. So this dot product is measuring the x component of our first vector here, which is going to be a. And we can see the same thing if we do the computational formula for a dot product. We're going to get a times 1 plus b times 0 plus c times 0. And that's going to give us a, the x component of our vector, as a result. What that means is that if we pick our unit vector to be 1, 0, 0, then the result we get here is the x component of curl. And similarly, if we dotted it with 0, 1, 0, this would give us the y component, and 0, 0, 1 would give us the z component. So if we do the dot product with those three coordinates, that gives us all of the information that we need to get a complete formula for curl. Now I have another video where I go into a more in-depth explanation of the derivation for the formulas of curl and divergence. You can check the link in the description for that. In this video, I'm just going to give a quick overview of the derivation, and then we'll get straight to the formula. To get an idea of where the formula comes from, we're going to consider one of the coordinates. In this case, we're going to take n being just the unit vector in the x direction, 1, 0, 0. In that case, c is going to be in the plane defined by this x vector. That means it has to be in the y, z plane. So we have our closed curve here, this time in the y, z plane. And let's say that our vector field f has three components. Its x component is p, its y component is q, its z component is r. 
these letters PQR are just talking about functions that give us the x, y, and z values of our field. If we want the curl to be positive, the vector field needs to move in the direction of the curve, just like we saw before. Let's think about what happens as we move in the y direction. Like we said before, when we move to the right, the vector field has to point upward. Let's rephrase that in terms of the coordinates that we're looking at here. As we move in the positive y direction, the vector field has to point more in the positive z direction. What that means is that the z component of our vector field has to increase as the y component of the point increases. We can express that in terms of a partial derivative. If r gives the z component of our vector field, then the partial of r with respect to y talks about how the z component increases when we increase y. So we expect this to show up in our curl formula. If this is positive, our curl will be positive. Similarly, if we look at the top and bottom here, as we move in the positive z direction, our vector field points in the negative y direction. So we would expect the y component of our vector field to decrease as we move in the z direction. That means we want to subtract the partial derivative of q with respect to z. Because if this is negative, that means on top our curve points to the left, that's going to increase the value of our curl. This expression here, r sub y minus q sub z, is the x component of curl. And we can do a very similar process to what we just did here to get the y components and the z components as well. So if we repeat that same process that we just did with the normal vectors pointing in the y and z directions, we can get the y and z components of our vector, and this gives us the final formula for curl. To get the curl of our vector field at any point, all we do is evaluate the partial derivatives at that point. Now this formula is somewhat difficult to remember. There are a lot of variables moving around in here, so it makes it hard to memorize. Fortunately, there's a mnemonic that helps us remember this formula, and it looks like this. The curl of f is equal to nabla cross f. So this upside down triangle is called either del or nabla, and what it represents is a vector that has the partial derivative operators in it. So the partial with respect to x, partial with respect to y, and partial with respect to z. Of course, this is not a real vector, but if we treat it as a vector, it gives us the right answer at the end, which is why we use it. So we take the cross product between this vector and the vector of our vector field. If we take our del vector and the vector field and plug their components into the cross product formula, this will give us the exact same vector as we just saw was the curl. The reason that taking a cross product here works is that curl represents a change in the vector field orthogonal to the direction of movement. And the cross product also talks about orthogonal vectors, so we would expect these to be related. As an example, let's say we wanted to compute the curl of 2xy, x squared plus sine z, and xze to the y. So this is our vector field f. In that case, we can plug these values into our cross product determinant here. So all I've done here is taken the x, y, z components and plugged them in for pqr in our cross product formula. From here, we can expand along the top row using our determinant formulas. And when we do that, we get this expression that looks really complicated, but it's not actually complicated, it just has a lot of partial derivatives. So we have to do this partial derivative with respect to y, this partial derivative with respect to z, and expand everything out. And once we combine all our terms together and put them back into one vector, we get the final result for our curl of this vector field as xz e to the y minus cosine z, negative z e to the y, and zero. So that's how we understand curl. Each component in the curl vector represents the limit of a closed line integral, which talks about movement in the direction parallel to a closed curve. And because a circle's tangent is orthogonal to the radius, that measures how much the vector field curls in the direction orthogonal to its displacement. We can remember that formula for curl using this cross product with a del vector.